Deep beneath the Aegean Sea lies the rusting hulk of a giant ocean liner. But this is no ordinary wreck. When the Britannic sank in 1916, within a year of launch, it seemed the fulfillment of a curse. Because her sister was the Titanic, and she too had sunk just four years earlier with the loss of 1,500 lives. Even the first of the White Star Line superliners, the Olympic, suffered a series of accidents. Yet all three of these great ships were designed to be unsinkable. The thought that a vessel is unsinkable came to haunt the White Star Line, and certainly Harlan and Wolf, the builders. So were these losses just a tragic coincidence? Or was there some fundamental flaw which doomed both the Titanic and the Britannic? Could the answer still lie in the tangled and treacherous wreckage of the SS Britannic? Two out of three of a single class of liner to sink is, uh, is unprecedented, really. And, uh, you know, if you, if you analyse that, then you'd have to consider that really there's something fundamentally wrong there. The final decades of the 19th century were marked by unprecedented levels of migration. Between 1865 and 1914, about 20 million people left Europe in search of a new life in America. The only way to make the journey across the Atlantic was by sea. The shipping companies knew that bigger ships carrying more people meant bigger profits. These giant ships wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for all these immigrants. So that led to this natural development in the size of the vessel. They were built to service the market that was developing. But as well as catering for immigrants, the shipping lines wanted to satisfy the growing and highly lucrative demand from the rich for holidays abroad. The cost to, to travel first class in a suite of rooms for a five-day single crossing, in today's terms, would be about £27,000. The most profitable and prestigious route was London to New York. Competition between the two largest carriers in Britain, Cunard and the American-owned White Star Line, was intense. And Cunard and White Star found themselves, if you like, in some sort of arms race to build the largest and finest ships possible in those days. At the start of the 20th century, the Cunard Line had started a bit of a march on the White Star Line with the Lusitania and the Mauritania. So, um, in response, the White Star Line conceived the Olympic-class liners. Um, it was originally going to be a pair of liners followed by a third sister ship, the Olympic, Titanic and Britannic, which were designed to be grander and more luxurious than the Cunard rivals. The ships were nearly 900 feet long. The White Star brochure boasted they were as tall as the highest New York skyscraper. Size meant luxury, but it was also at the heart of the belief that these were the safest passenger vessels afloat. The popular press was swept along by the idea of giant ships, and that's what led to, to people just thinking that, yes, of course, if it's big, it must be therefore safer, sadly was not the case. Because of the size of the ships, if there was a collision, it, 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 you know, they're never going to come off second best because the, 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 size, the actual size of the ship is what gives it its protection. But obviously that, that thinking was flawed. Experts too seem to think that the Olympic class, as the three sister ships were known, was invulnerable. This confidence was based on a design innovation Watertight doors fitted at intervals in the ship's hulls. In the event of a collision, a switch on the bridge could close them automatically to prevent flooding. The media were happy to accept White Star's confident claims. There was a magazine at the time, the Shipbuilder Marine Engineer, and it contained the words practically unsinkable when they were referring to the Olympic and the Titanic. This practically unsinkable uh, was very much embellished and gradually, slowly but surely, the words practically went completely. And so all of a sudden, Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable. It was an idea that was kicking around that 
marine technology had got to such a point that we were making vessels so large and so safe that they would be unsinkable. On a wave of ambition and arrogance, the industry was heading inevitably for disaster. In the Belfast shipyard, Olympic and Titanic were built side by side. So enormous were they that 4,000 men were employed to finish Olympic in time for her launch. But just four months later, there was an ominous portent of things to come. While maneuvering in the Solent, suction from the vessel's enormous propellers caused a collision with a Navy cruiser, HMS Hawk. Olympic's hull was badly gashed, and she was forced out of service for six weeks. We were only really just beginning to understand the dynamics of how these large vessels behave in water. In 1912, the, the crew, the officers had really no experience of it. It was, it was on the job training, on the job learning. It's like converting a car to a juggernaut without considering the way it's going to handle, handle or, or how it's going to drive. At the subsequent inquiry, Olympic was held solely to blame. But with so much at stake, White Star was in no mood for self-doubt. Instead of learning the lessons of the near disaster, the company turned the argument on its head. If Olympic could stay afloat after such a serious collision, they argued, it just proved how unsinkable the three giant superliners were. Seven months later, on April the 10th, 1912, Titanic set sail from Southampton on her maiden voyage. Even as she left harbor, the bow wave from her enormous hull nearly caused a disaster. She drew alongside another passenger vessel. That vessel heeled over to one side. Its mooring ropes were broken, and the vessel almost collided with Titanic. As the second ship swung free, Titanic's tugs pulled her clear with just four feet to spare. It's an irony that if that collision had in fact taken place, um, Titanic probably wouldn't have struck the iceberg. Titanic's captain, Edward Smith, shrugged off the near miss. 1,500 people were now condemned to die. The newsreels of the day reconstructed the events that followed. Four days into the crossing, the Titanic received warnings of icebergs ahead. Shortly before midnight, a lookout spotted an iceberg jutting out of the sea straight ahead. Furious attempts were made to turn the ship, but within seconds, impact occurred. Titanic was traveling at 20 knots when she struck the iceberg, and in less than 10 seconds, it had gouged a 300-foot-long gash in the ship's hull beneath the waterline. At 12.15, Titanic sent out her first SOS. Ironically, Olympic was one of a handful of ships to receive it and immediately altered course towards her stricken sister, but to no avail. Within two hours, Titanic went down in the worst disaster in maritime history. In less than a year, White Star's first superliner had been involved in a serious collision, and the second had sunk, leaving thousands in mourning and survivors traumatized. Yet still, White Star refused to admit there was a problem. They considered the Titanic disaster an absolute fluke and the chances of it happening again were, you know, one in a million. So they decided to stick with the Olympic class design. So they decided to employ the same design on Britannic uh, with a few modifications, you know, we'll, we'll raise the bulkheads, we'll put a double skin hull on uh, and that's all we need to do. The chances of uh, hitting another iceberg or a Titanic type, type disaster are just, you know, they're too remote to even consider. The die was cast. Once again, arrogance and ambition would lead to tragedy. The Britannic would soon be completed. And within a year, she too would sink. On April the 15th, 1912, Britain was stunned by news that Titanic had sunk and more than 1,500 people had perished. The impact on the ship's owners, the White Star Line, was immediate. It was a disaster for the company. 
and a disaster for the builders. Faith in these superliners looked increasingly flawed. Even um, poor old Captain Smith, commander of Titanic, uh, in an interview said that he could not conceive of an accident that would cause the loss of a modern passenger liner. We were lulled into a false sense of security. Less than a year after the launch of the largest passenger liners in the world, one had been lost forever and the other involved in a serious collision. The claim that their sheer size guaranteed their safety was beginning to sound hollow. And now White Star had another problem. Construction of the third and largest of the three ships, Britannic, was already well advanced and it was too late to change the design. When you design a ship, like the Olympic and the Titanic, you really design, you start out with one design form, and that design form was Olympic. You draw a vessel once, and then you make a series of adjustments and modifications through the learning process of having that ship in operation. Britannic had to have really a, a whole radical rethink, but it was really too late to to scrap the idea and start again. You had to just modify what was there. Following the Titanic disaster, uh, White Star were obviously very nervous about, um, about Britannic, and um, it, it, to that effect, they, they posted one of their most senior captains, Captain Bartlett, to oversee the construction of Britannic, and, and finally to Commander, and it was extremely important to the White Star line that. Uh, the Britannic was a, was a success, basically to wipe the slate clean for uh, White Star and uh, to get the whole Titanic, um, uh, remove Titanic from the, from the public psyche. White Star had mortgaged its entire fleet to finance the Olympic class's construction. Having lost Titanic, they could not afford to cancel the Britannic. Nor would the decision have gone down well with the chairman of shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe, Lord Pirrie. He had personally encouraged the building of these giant ships. Pirrie himself had always dreamed of building the world's first 1,000-foot liner. So to build Olympic and Titanic and Britannic would be one step towards his own personal goal. Pirrie was also a director of White Star and stood to gain financially from the contract. From 1869 to 1919, there wasn't a day in which Harland and Wolfe didn't have a White Star ship under construction. White Star's managing director, J. Bruce Ismay, had pinned his faith on the three sisters to see off the company's arch rivals, Cunard. Piri and Ismay um, were both of the same mind. They had huge egos and um, they, they wanted the world to see that they owned the largest grandest, most luxurious uh, liners afloat. To them it was, um, it was the overriding factor in, in their, in their uh, design philosophy. In 1907, helped by a huge loan from the British government, Cunard had stolen a march in the quest for supremacy on the London to New York route. They launched two state-of-the-art ships, the Mauritania and the Lusitania, at the time the largest passenger liners ever built, offering new standards of luxury. A revolutionary bow design, allowing them to cut through oncoming waves and advance steam turbine engines, made them the fastest steamships in the world. Within a year of their launch, the Lusitania and Mauritania set speed records for crossing the Atlantic, cutting the journey time to New York to under five days. But J. Bruce Ismay believed passengers would choose luxury over speed. His ships were therefore nearly 100 feet longer than Cunard's, and their fittings even more lavish. He was convinced their unprecedented size would bring great prestige for White Star. The only revolutionary feature of these three vessels was their great size. They're a, a standard design form that has just been lengthened. If you look at the rudder or the stern of the Lusitania and the Mauritania, it's a balanced stern. It's designed to turn this vessel, this high-speed vessel, very quickly in an emergency. 
poor old uh, Olympic and Titanic and Britannic stern is just an old design idea from the sailing ship days. What they basically did was jumboized a um, an, an old an old design, um, just scaled it up. But um, in, in doing that, they actually encountered a lot of problems which uh, previously had been unrecorded. Some aspects of their design had more to do with showmanship than function. Originally, the ships had three funnels, but rival Cunard liners had four. Fearing his ships looked less powerful, J. Bruce Ismay fitted an extra funnel for effect. It was purely cosmetic. Uh, in fact, on the Titanic, the fourth funnel was used to store pets. Titanic's sinking exploded the myth of the Olympic class's invincibility. Building on the Britannic was suspended and a government inquiry demanded extensive safety modifications to the ship. Titanic's hull had been subdivided by a series of bulkheads into 16 watertight compartments. Even with four of these flooded, the ship should have stayed afloat. A bulkhead basically separates sections of the ship into individual areas. The idea being that if an area of the ship is damaged and begins to take on water, it's contained within a specific space between two bulkheads. The bulkheads in Titanic's forward compartments weren't high enough to stop water spilling into the huge boiler rooms. It was that factor, the sheer volume of water rushing into the hold, which sent Titanic so quickly to the seabed. On Titanic, the, the bulkheads didn't go all the way to the top decks. And so what happened was when the, when the forward compartments began to fill up, um, as the ship listed by the, um, by the bow, water spilled over the top of the bulkheads, uh, kind of like an, an, an ice cube tray effect until um, it got to a point where, it got to a point of no return really. The difference with Britannic is the bulkheads were raised all the way to the upper decks, the idea being that even if the ship started to list, there was no way the water could spill over from one compartment to another. In addition, a double skin was added to the Britannic's hull around the huge boiler rooms to protect it from being torn open by an object like an iceberg. But there was another lesson from the Titanic. So confident were her designers in her safety and her ability to summon help using the new wireless technology that they decided she only needed lifeboats for half of those on board. They never thought that the ship would sink before they were able to call for another vessel's assistance. Britannic was fitted with a surplus of lifeboats stacked on enormous gantries. With these modifications to Britannic, the largest of the three sisters, White Star's confidence returned. Her launch booklet included this bold claim. In the new Britannic, we see both in design and construction as perfect a specimen of man's creative power as it is possible to conceive. The reality was different. She was a dinosaur, really, when she came into service. She was outclassed before she even went down the ways by liners like the Lusitania and the Mauritania. She wasn't even the largest liner in the world when she entered the water because the Germans had built bigger, faster and more palatial ships. But Britannic never served as a luxury liner. By the time of her launch in 1915, the First World War was raging and most passenger services across the Atlantic had been suspended. Britain's military campaigns in the Mediterranean and the Middle East left thousands dead and wounded. With many of these needing evacuation back to Britain, the government ordered the Britannic to be converted into a hospital ship. She was fitted out with operating rooms, an intensive care unit, and more than 3,000 beds. In December 1915, freshly repainted in the internationally recognized colors of the Red Cross, she left Southampton for the first of six voyages to the Mediterranean. On board were 400 army surgeons, doctors, medical orderlies and nurses. One of these nurses was Violet Jessup, a survivor of the Titanic disaster. Despite her Titanic nightmare, 
she had written to the White Star Line asking for a job aboard the Britannic as a stewardess. She had no fears about serving on the Titanic's even larger sister. Later, she wrote, It was like going into a new world to board that stately hospital ship. She looked like a great white swan. In November 1916, Britannic was sent on a mission through the Kia Channel off mainland Greece to collect up to 3,000 casualties of war. To reach them, she had to sail deep into the war zone of the eastern Mediterranean, risking attack by German U-boats. Her destination was the Allied naval base at Mudros on the island of Lemnos, where she was to take on wounded from base hospitals and other much smaller ships. On the 21st of November, she was steaming two and a half miles off Kia Island. Suddenly, there was a violent underwater explosion. Something had holed the ship. Captain Bartlett ordered all watertight doors closed. He knew the bulkhead should prevent her from sinking. So why then was she taking on catastrophic amounts of water? In desperation, Bartlett restarted the engines to drive her aground on Kia Island. Heading towards Kia, faster and faster and faster, began to drive the bow deeper and deeper into the water. And as the ship began to slowly roll over onto her starboard side, it became quite clear to the captain that he had to start getting people off the ship. At the Britannic stern, there was panic as the deck began to tilt. Some crew members lowered lifeboats without permission. Titanic survivor nurse Violet Jessup was in one of them. She recorded what happened next in a diary that has passed to her niece. A few minutes after the lifeboat first touched the water, every man jack in the group of surrounding boats took a flying leap into the sea. It was extraordinary to find myself in the space of a few minutes almost the only occupant of the boat. I turned round to see the reason for the exodus and to my horror saw Britannic's huge propellers churning and mincing up everything near them. Men, boats and everything were just one ghastly whirl. As the lifeboats hit the water, they were sucked into the Britannic's massive rotating portside propeller, which with the ship now listing badly, was rising out of the sea. In 1911, uh, the pull-in suction of the Olympic was strong enough to pull uh, an armoured cruiser, HMS Hawk, into the side of the ship and do considerable damage. 1912, as Titanic was leaving Southampton, the suction from propellers was enough to pull the liner New York from the quayside. So the small lifeboats of the Britannic, 34 feet long, would have had no chance, no chance at all. Everybody that was killed on Britannic was killed in a lifeboat, as opposed to Titanic, where everybody that, was, everybody that died, died because they weren't in a lifeboat. 30 people who had taken to the lifeboats lost their lives. Incredibly, Titanic survivor Violet Jessup was not one of them. Although unable to swim, she jumped into the water and surfaced underneath the capsized lifeboat. It took the full impact of the churning propellers and saved her life. Violet escaped with a fractured skull and was among 1,100 people who survived. It's a blessing, really, that the, um, the Britannic sank on its way to Mudros because um, it had been an absolute catastrophe um, had they actually picked up war wounded on the way back because you know, they, all, all the war wounded were obviously incapacitated. Um, they would have been effectively been trapped inside, the, inside the, uh, the ship when it went down and there would have been an absolute huge loss of life, thousands, thousands. So as it was, um, it was just a few unlucky people killed in the lifeboat. In the clamor of war and overshadowed by the Titanic, those few deaths were all but forgotten. But today, 87 years on, the questions remain. What caused the explosion? And why did she sink so fast? Well, here we are in the Keir Channel. It's now half past nine in the morning. And I, I would imagine that what we're looking at now is pretty much what Captain Bartlett would have been looking at on the morning of 21st of November, 1916. Professional diver Carl Spencer has dived Titanic on several occasions. Now he's assembled an expert team to find out exactly what happened to Britannic, her bigger sister. What we plan to do is um, is penetrate the hull and, and find out exactly why the Britannic sank so fast despite the modifications that were made by the Border Trade Inquiry following the Titanic disaster. To solve this mystery, 
Carl and his team must complete a difficult and dangerous dive to the very heart of the wreck, a dive that has never before been attempted. The wreck lies at 120 meters, nearly 400 feet down. The main dangers of diving the Britannic are the depth. At 120 metres, it is right on the limit of human physiology, particularly because of the length of time that our divers need to spend at depth in order to complete the mission objectives. The first thing that anyone who's ever dived the Britannic will say is that, it, that the sheer size of the thing is absolutely enormous. It's an incredible sight and it, it just blows you away. Behind the bridge, they discover the captain's bath, with the plug still in. There are few traces of luxury, just medicine cabinets and some of the 3,000 hospital beds on board. Near the staircase originally intended for first-class passengers, they find a drinking fountain. The, the ship is totally intact, uh, apart from the, uh, the, the tear in the bow. You, you, you look at the ship and it's, uh, it's absolutely magnificent. It looks like the day it sailed. Inside the radio room, a Marconi wireless set last used to send SOS calls as the ship began to sink. It's like a window into the past. You, you look at the ship and it's, uh, you know, it's a monument to a bygone age. It's, um, it's fantastic. But the clues to the real cause of the disaster will not be found here, on the upper decks. After the explosion, water somehow flooded the massive forward boiler room in the heart of the ship, and the divers need to get into there to find out why. Richie Stevenson thinks he's found a way in. I think what I found is a tunnel um, in the break. It's just right, just where the keel is. Right. Right at the very bottom. And then right on the roof, which is obviously now on its side, if you can make sense of that, there's two big, huge, some sort of pipe work system. So I thought, well, it, it, it looks like it, it could lead um, towards the engines and the boilers, and that then looked like that was more, more of a sensible way through for the firemen, the engine room men, to make their way from boiler room to boiler room to boiler room. Right. It's just like a, a low walkway going between the sets of boilers. Right. It looks like that little fireman's tunnel that's on the uh, on the plans. It right. does look like it. I'm overweighted. Well done, Rich. If this tunnel does indeed lead to the heart of the ship, the team may be one step nearer to finding just what doomed the Titanic and her sisters. Somewhere in the barnacled wreck of the Titanic sister ship Britannic, there are clues as to why she sank so quickly on a November day in 1916. Modifications to the design after the Titanic sank should have made her safer. But she went down in only 50 minutes, three times faster than Titanic. 87 years on, an expert team of divers has been assembled to establish exactly what happened. At the time, the Navy's own findings were inconclusive. Some eyewitnesses reported seeing torpedo trails seconds before the explosion. Britannic's captain, Charles Bartlett, went to his grave believing a torpedo sank his ship. Others suspected the Britannic struck a mine, and after the war, a U-boat commander, Gustav Cease, claimed his submarine had laid that mine. Captain Barton said the uh, explosion occurred very, very low down. Beyond that, we're really not quite sure. But if you look at the wreck on the seabed, you just cannot find the keel. It's just not there in that area. So it seems to indicate that the explosion took place right beneath the ship. A torpedo would have struck on the ship's waterline. Mine damage would be much lower on the hull. The dive team are looking for evidence that points one way or another. They'll also scar the seabed for debris. Torpedoes leave little behind, but mines are tethered to the seabed by cradles, which may still be there. As the mines were laid, each one was released from its cradle to float at the end of a steel cable between 10 and 15 feet below the surface. 
touched by a passing ship, it would explode. For the first time ever, an extensive and systematic search of the Kia channel is underway. The aim is to prove once and for all what sank the Britannic. The team lower a high-tech sonar device into the water. Yeah, it gives a little bit of cable. Ready? Okay, it's flying. It will enable the dive team to pinpoint the smallest objects lying on the seabed. Images are fed back to a monitor aboard the boat for sonar imaging expert Bill Smith to analyze. As they pass over an area near the wreck site, Bill sees something interesting scattered on the sea floor. It's nearly 50 meters in slant range. But look, there's bits everywhere. There's some more up there, there's a bit there, there's a bit there. There's just a scattering of isolated debris field, but it's quite big. So could this trail of debris mark the exact location of the initial explosion? Divers hurry to search the area, but what they actually find is debris from two of the Britannic's four funnels, torn off as she rolled beneath the waves. The hunt continues over several days, and finally Bill's confident he's made a breakthrough found a perfect line of evenly spaced small targets so we need to do a little bit more work on that but it seems very likely that what we've got is a perfect line of mine cradles. Back on land Bill analyzes the data. It's from an area of seabed just under one mile south of the wreck of Britannic. What you have to imagine here is this is a, an aerial photograph of the seabed with the water taken away. Right in the very centre, we suddenly get these objects. There's one here. Then there's another one, exactly the same. There's a third one down there. And what we have between them, when you look a little bit further down, there's a small round object here. What appears to be like a broken open piece of eggshell. There's the back half of the eggshell. And that looks very, very much like a smashed open, like a smashed open mine lying on the bottom. If we go a little bit higher up, and on this top one, you can actually see its little arms that once grasped the mine before it was dropped. The team's discovery tallies with British intelligence reports from 1916 and the claims of German U-boat commander Gustav Sees whose submarine, the U-73, had been in the Aegean near to where the Britannic sank. On the 28th of October 1916, U-73 laid 12 mines across the Kia Channel. Three weeks later, the Britannic steamed into the heart of the minefield. It was one of these 12 mines that blew a huge hole in her bow, allowing water to rush in. But the modifications made to Britannic after the Titanic disaster should have kept her afloat, even with a ruptured hull. The designers claimed she could survive with as many as six of her watertight compartments flooded. If she did hit a mine, the worst possible damage that could be is, is, is on a bulkhead and she would flood two compartments. So the question is, is why did she go down flooding two compartments when really, when theoretically she could have stayed afloat with six? compartments flooded. Britannic's sister ship, the Titanic, sank with only five of her compartments flooded after an iceberg left a 300-foot gash in her hull. But while the Titanic took over three hours to sink, the Britannic went down in just 50 minutes. When Jacques Cousteau dived the wreck in 1975, he discovered a number of the ship's metal hull plates were bent outwards, suggesting, so he thought, that there had been a second explosion inside the Britannic. Some historians speculated that the Britannic may have been carrying an illicit cargo of munitions, which detonated after the ship struck the mine. But when he found large deposits of coal spread out over the seabed, Cousteau concluded that there had been a coal dust explosion. Subsequent dives have shed little light on why the Britannic sank so fast. This time, the team want to test the theory 
that it was the method used to construct the hull of the Olympic class which made the effect of the mine so much worse. The huge steel plates that made up their hull were held in place by millions of rivets. Laurie Johnson, an expert on steel corrosion and the team's scientific advisor, has found an example of a similar riveting process on a steel barge in a bay a few miles from the Britannic's wreck. On Britannic, uh, it was cold riveted, so they would actually drive in the rivets when they're cold. Um, the rivets themselves end up being quite important because they're a dissimilar metal. They tend to be more of a mild steel than the hull plating, which tends to be a much tougher steel. Um, so the rivet is actually the point where corrosion tends to start the most. So you can see it um, just up against here that this is where a lot of the corrosion begins. Uh, if there's any type of rubbing against it with Titanic, of course, the iceberg, but with Britannic, with either a mine or, or a torpedo, um, this is the area of stress, a weak point. You can easily shave off the heads of rivets, which end up popping the plates, and they separate, allowing water in. So the extensive damage to the Britannic's hull found by Cousteau was not caused by a secondary explosion as he thought, but instead was the result of the mine triggering a more wide-scale separation of the hull plating. So with a gaping hole in her bow, Britannic's survival depended on her system of watertight bulkheads redesigned in the wake of the Titanic's loss. These were fitted with watertight doors that could be operated from the bridge or in the event of an emergency, on the spot by hand. If kept shut, these doors should have prevented flooding in the hull. It's already known that a bulkhead in front of number six boiler room failed as water rushed into the ship. But to assess if there'd been a more widespread failure, divers will need to get access to the fireman's passage. This is the corridor running through the ship, linking the Britannic's huge boiler rooms with the crew's quarters in the bow. Previous dive teams only got to the upper decks. The new expedition intends to penetrate deeper into the ship's hull than ever before. At a depth of 400 feet, their time on the wreck is severely restricted. They need to use special equipment to recycle their oxygen supply. And even with this technology, they have only 30 minutes per dive to explore inside the Britannic. It's a job for only the most experienced deep water diver, requiring a difficult and dangerous journey through the decaying wreck. To get deep inside the hull, a diver has to squeeze his body and equipment through the tightest of openings. Finally, the fireman's passage. As he makes his way into the forward boiler room, his video camera captures startling new evidence from deep inside the cursed liner. No less than two of the watertight doors designed to prevent water flooding through the ship are clearly wide open. It's the crucial clue that might explain why Britannic went down so quickly. I think for me the single most important piece of videotape has got to be the footage inside that boiler room, the open watertight doors. Um, had that door closed, Britannic would have survived. It's as simple as that. But why were the doors open? The timing of the explosion offers a clue. There was a standing regulation when you were in uh, waters known to contain submarines that you would close all watertight doors, secure all hatches and basically run as watertight a ship as possible. Eight o'clock in the morning though is the time when they change watches. Even if the explosion occurred just as the watch changed, discipline on board should have secured all doors. Perhaps the design and regulations just didn't take account of human nature. Any vessel that's divided by a series of bulkheads. You need to still allow access between the various compartments or rooms. 
in that vessel. And so, although technically, or by the rules, those bulkheads should have been closed in a danger zone, it's impractical to have those doors closed because the engine room staff cannot move between boiler room and, and engine and the stokers can't stoke properly. So what they would do is they would leave some watertight doors open. But why in the immediate aftermath of the explosion weren't desperate efforts made to close them? Considering the amount of underwater damage that we know Britannic sustained, I would imagine that the automatic system for closing the watertight doors controlled from the bridge was completely upset. So there would only be local control over that. Now, if the lights in the engine room were failing and people were trying to escape that area, it's inconceivable that then people would start closing the doors. You're really in the business of trying to save lives in a situation like that. These engines were four storeys high. That meant, um, in order to accommodate them, the, the engine rooms had to be absolutely huge. Now, why, why everything was running smoothly, that, that was fine and no problem. However, if the watertight barriers were breached for whatever reason, and those um, areas became flooded with water, it was fatal to the ship. Once uh, water starts pouring into those uh, areas, it, it, it's such a large percentage of the internal volume of the ship that physics say that you know, it, just ca it just cannot stay afloat. It's a mathematical certainty that, that the ship is going to sink if it takes on that much water. With watertight doors gaping open and flawed rivets weakening the hull, the Britannic was doomed. But the team were to discover one more factor in her tragic demise. In the Kia Channel off the Greek mainland, a mission to solve the mystery of the sinking of the Titanic sister ship, the Britannic, has reached a crucial phase. An expert team has proved that the Britannic, while operating as a hospital ship in 1916, struck a mine. The mine blew a gaping hole in the Britannic's bow. Seawater rushed in, and because crucial watertight doors were left open, the Britannic sank in just 50 minutes. The design of the Olympic-class liners meant that if water got into the massive engine rooms, the ships were doomed. She had so large compartments that when they filled with water, it was literally the weight of the water that dragged her down. She would have been far better if her bow had been completely ripped off in that collision with the mine. I think probably she would have survived. But the divers have also discovered another reason why so much water got inside the Britannic so quickly. In a remarkable breach of on-ship regulations, a number of portholes had been left wide open. This is a vessel that has no, no air conditioning, and particularly below or on the water line, it's very stuffy down there. Remember, it's a coal-fired vessel. It produces a lot of heat. The vessel is designed for the North Atlantic service, not designed to go um, cruising around the Mediterranean in those temperatures. I could understand people uh, wanting to break the rules and leave the, the portals open. Everyone does things with the best intentions. They probably thought, well, if there is an accident, I'll quickly shut it and everything will be fine. Well, you know, <laughs> grab your life belt, get up on deck as quick as possible. A deadly combination of bad luck and human error meant that the Britannic's enhanced safety features were never used. Without them, she sank like a stone. The Britannic's catastrophic end reignited the debate about size and safety. Many asked how smaller vessels could survive torpedo attacks while Britannic went down so fast. Only two days after the Britannic went down, Another hospital ship, Braemar Castle, struck a second mine laid by U-boat 73. Much smaller and lighter than the Britannic, the Braemar Castle beached successfully and went on to survive the war. 
After a disaster in peacetime and a disaster in war, it was becoming clear that the grand design aims of Britannic and Titanic were really an expression of pride at the expense of safety. Once the watertight defenses on the giant liner were breached, the vessel simply could not stay afloat. She was such an enormous vessel that uh, her size, her very size, the illusion of safety was in fact her Achilles heel. If a curse had sent both the Britannic and the Titanic to the bottom of the sea, their older sister Olympic suffered too. Within a few months of her launch, she had collided with a Navy cruiser, forcing her back into dry dock. In 1934, she rammed and sank the Nantucket lightship with the loss of seven lives. Like her sisters, the root of the problem was her sheer size and displacement. Smaller vessels were simply sucked in by her huge propellers. Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic, doomed monuments to the ambition and pride of two Edwardian millionaires who were determined to own and operate the largest ships to ever take to the sea. Piri and Ismay's arrogance and egos, really, to build the, the, the largest, grandest liners and their, uh, their you know, competitiveness with, with Cunard to go one better all the time, really, is what, is what doomed the Olympic-class liners. They were using old technology, they were using outmoded designs, and um, they, they, they really had this, this tunnel vision where, where biggest, bigger was better. Uh, without considering the consequences and uh, unfortunately that's what doomed the Olympic class liners.